interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. We may have to give up by noon. We don't know yet. They are throwing men and shells at it, and we may not be able to stand it. That's one thing. First of all, you've got to accept something. That you're a prisoner of war. You have no rights. You've lost everything. No help has come. We haven't seen anything. We haven't got any food. We haven't got any reinforcements. We haven't got nothing. We're sold down the roof. We are waiting for God only knows what. Within hours of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese bombed American air bases on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. By the beginning of January 1942, American troops were defending the Bataan Peninsula on the western side of Manila Bay. What transpired over the next several months was the beginning of the end for many of the 80,000 men called upon to hold this mountainous terrain a landscape cut by steep ravines and impenetrable jungles. Americans and their Filipino allies somehow managed to hold out against overwhelming odds. In fact, they were fighting two wars, one with a well-fed, well-equipped enemy streaming toward them, and another more personal war against intense tropical heat, a dwindling supply of ammunition, starvation rations, malaria, dysentery, and a host of other tropical diseases that gave no quarter. As on-the-scene war correspondent Frank Hewlett put it so tersely, we are the battling bastards of Bataan. No mama, no papa, no Uncle Sam. No aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no nieces. No pills, no planes, no artillery pieces. And nobody gives a damn. Day the uh, Jap planes would come over and they'd be bombing and scraping, and most of they flew overhead, and the artillery was going. Over. And one day, one of my friends had both his legs blown off, and I went to help him, and I was throwing up, and and, and uh, I couldn't help him, and he he was crying because his feet hurt, and he had no feet, and we were there, I think about three months. Then in April, I said to my lieutenant. Uh, I'm going to be 22 years old on the 7th of April, and he said, you'll never see it. On April 9, 1942, the American Army commander on Bataan had no choice but to unconditionally surrender 76,000 troops to the Japanese. 12,000 of them were Americans. It was the largest surrender of U.S. troops in American history. During the devastating hardships on Bataan, moments of bravery surfaced even in a rudimentary Bataan hospital setting. Well, Colonel Gillespie, who was commandant of the camp, he protested vigorously about the Japanese taking the food and the medicine, what was left up for themselves, the Japanese officer that was stationed in the hospital. Uh, he threatened uh, Colonel Gillespie several times. He says, don't ever, don't ever complain to me again. But uh, Gillespie continued to complain. And he had showed a lot of courage. And just when it couldn't get worse, it got worse. 72,000 Americans and Filipinos, 
already emaciated and disease-ridden from their three-month ordeal in Bataan, started a 65-mile forced march north. It was a march through hell. Japanese soldiers prodded the malaria-stricken prisoners with bayonets and committed random beheadings by the roadside. These desperate men, whose status was now classified as POW, had no food, no water, no medicine, and no hope. Their destination was Camp O'Donnell. For many, their personal destiny was death on the road, or hoping for death to come quickly. Only 54,000 reached Camp O'Donnell. 5,000 to 10,000 Filipinos and 700 Americans died trying to get there. After the surrender, though, it was unbelievable the way men was treated. I mean, you couldn't understand that men, some of them on crutches, some of them barefooted, some of them had dysentery walking along the road, blood running down their legs. And they'd, they'd stop us every few minutes. They'd congregate, put us in columns of uh, groups of a hundred with guards on each side. A lot of men, it fell out, they shot them beside the road, around a bandit through them right there. Some of them take off out across the field, the guards and shoot them. They even buried some of the Filipinos about half dead to make somebody else dig a hole, beat them in the head with a shovel and burn them alive and pack a dirt on them. Hey, you're talking about a nightmare. It was a nightmare, but you, hey, you built a shell around you and you lost your emotions and you was more like a robot that somebody was commanding you to do things. Well, they, they made us <clears throat> go down to uh, Marvellous and line up on the airstrip down there. And then uh, we got uh, orders, you know, to start the march. So we started the Batan Death March out of Marvellous. Mm -hmm. And uh, along the road, uh, <clears throat> the Japanese had their field artillery on uh, one of the airstrips up there. And they were going to march us down in front of their guns. So if Cregador fired back, see, they'd hit us. Oh. So just about the time, we was marching in column of fours, about the time they said, turn the left and go down that way, Cregador fired. And a shell come, didn't miss me very far, but it came in at an angle and just sit on the road and scooted down the road. Didn't go off. Didn't go off. <laughs> and we just did about face and went on up that road. We didn't go down there in front of them guns. See, I think we had one meal on the 65 mile march and uh, they wouldn't let you get water, nothing. <clears throat> I just had the determination to keep going and I wasn't gonna let them get me down. And uh, some of them would give up or they didn't survive. Yeah, I had one of them, my boys in my outfit, I'd, I'd make him get up ahead of the column. And I said, then you can slow down till you get to the back, but don't be caught at the rear end. And everybody else gone, cause they'll kill you then. And that's what they'd do if you fell out on the side, they'd just kill you. If these POWs survived the march to Camp O'Donnell by sheer grit and determination, a new hell awaited them at their destination. Dysentery, malaria, and malnutrition ran rampant. 2,200 Americans and 27,000 Filipinos died at Camp O'Donnell. You could smell that camp 10 miles before you got there. I was on burial detail for approximately uh, six months. We buried 26,000 Filipinos, about 2,500 Americans. Not counting those was executed now. And guys laying there dying, smelling, they had one latrine at one end of the camp, one at the other, old straddle trench. Maggots constantly working in all of that crap where these men had gone. Some of them laying around at dysentery so bad, they'd just lay around that hole. And you had one spigot for the whole camp. And you'd get up the line up to get water. You had to get somebody, get, you got a half a cup of water a day is all you got. You didn't get a bath or nothing. And the Japanese, every morning, they give you one bowl of rice and a cup of fish soup. That's what you got. 
At noontime, you got a cup of fish soup, and a, I mean a bowl of rice and a cup of fish soup. And I used to keep a little stick about that long tied on my little old string I had around the G-string here. And when I went on burrow detail, I'd just take that stick, and some of the guys blowed up. Some of them just nothing but skin and bone, but some of them had blowed up. You'd run that stick down through their stomach, you know, let the gas off. Yeah. Then they'd have to go down and keep them carrying all that weight because the cemetery is about, I reckon, about a mile from camp over to Zero Ward where they kept them all that had died and stack them out. Then you had to go almost a mile to the rice paddy where you'd burn them. When you come in the front gate, the ground was littered with dead bodies, American boys, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old boys, blue eyes, black eyes, brown eyes, stared up into the sky laying on the ground. So they put me on the burial detail, and I carry a body down to the burial ground, and we buried them, and in, 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 they had holes that previously dug. The, the holes were only about 18 inches deep, and they were like 20 feet wide and 40 feet long. And we laid the bodies in there side by side, and we put the, um, the dog tags in their mouths so they could be identified later on. Dysentery uh, diseases. Uh, they were they were drinking the water from streams, uh, all polluted for animal urine, urine, and, and that, that's what killed them. They all did just and and starvation. The POWs were then transported to Cabanatuan, the largest internment camp in the Philippines, located 100 miles north of Manila. In mid 1942. Approximately 2,000 American POWs had died at the hands of the Japanese. The guy that numbered skin and bones. Now, people have read about the Holocaust. They've seen films about the Holocaust. But they've never seen films of the atrocities in the Southwest Pacific. Well, if you're so subject to shock every day, you become a little immune to it, but not entirely. Now it's during the now I'm 23 years old now, and it's rainy season. The rain is pouring down. I'm, I weigh 75 pounds. I slept on bamboo. Uh, they had little bamboo huts, and, and I slept on bamboo. And when you get up in the morning, the guy next to you would be dead. The next day, the guy on the other side would be dead. The death, I was surrounded by death all the time, and I, I, uh, I had dysentery, so I, it was rainy scene, the rain was pouring down, so I ran, now they had these uh, outhouses, that were just wooden, wooden boxes over a hole in the ground, well, the thing collapsed, and then I went into the manure, and I come up, and now all I had on was a G-string, no clothes, just a G-string, so I lost my G-string, I'm completely naked, it's three o'clock in the morning, I'm 23 years old, I weigh 75 pounds, and I'm washing myself in the, off in the rain, and I'm crying, I'm saying, God, what am I doing here? Japan looked to these prisoners as sources of labor. From 1942 to mid-1945, more than 126,000 Allied POWs were transported to Japan and other conquered territories in rusty cargo ships to serve as forced laborers. Japanese guards stuffed POWs into holds with little air, food, and water, and they had no sanitary facilities. These ships were unmarked and therefore easy prey for American planes and submarines. Many of these so-called hell ships, each transporting hundreds or up to 3,000 Allied POWs, were tragically sunk by American bombs and torpedoes. More than 21,000 men died on these Japanese hell ships. Oh, listen. Guys screaming. Guys hollering. My God, I said, hey, man, this is the end of the world. And uh, But I always put a little humor to it. You know, you got to have a little humor. And I tell guys, I said, listen. If you don't eat that rice, you ain't going home. I said, brother, you better get with it. Be white worms and old stuff had been stored in. You eat worms and all. You just got down in a hole there and you wasn't supposed to get out. It was awful down in there. There was really no secret that they were going to send us. They said that we were to be uh, medical personnel to the all the prisoners of war that they had in uh, 
Japan. In that group, there were a number of dentists and a number of doctors, and uh, there were 10 dentists, 40 doctors, and and the rest uh, of the 150 were corpsmen. The day came, they didn't announce the day, they just told us that we were going. Mm -hmm. And we got on the boat. It was the NRO Maru. Mm -hmm. We were down in the hold, and uh, a couple of times a day they would lower a bucket with rice, in it and a bucket of, a bucket of tea and I don't know whether they used the same buckets or not but we had to, uh, they'd have something off in the corner it was attached to rope to to put your excrement in yeah. and they'd pull that up with a rope and dump it over the side of the boat and uh, twice a day though we would get tea and rice the hatch to where we were and uh, we could hear the sound of, of guns. The story was that a ship or two in our convoy had been hit, but we weren't hit. But we could hear the guns. If the boat had been sunk, we would have gone down with it since we were in. The hatch was sealed, yeah. They had these uh, toilets overhanging the, the water. And you'd go up and you'd sit on that, but you were always scared to death that it might come loose and you'd land up in the Pacific. Living conditions were somewhat better in these labor camps. It was in the interest of the Japanese war effort to keep these men alive to do grueling, dangerous, manual labor either in the coal mines and factories or in the shipyards. I did the little as I could because I didn't want to do anything that would help them instead of the American coming back. Because I told them one time, after I got to Japan working in the coal mine, and so the, <clears throat> I, that one of them, the civilians were over us in the mine. The soldiers stayed up topside. And they wanted you to work fast. I mean, he grabbed my shovel when I was shoveling coal one day, and he just started. And uh, he said, that's the way he wanted me to work. I says, I, I, every time I put a shovel of coal out, that keeps Uncle Sam away that much longer. Mm -hmm. And boy, they got me. They beat me. <laughs> I, I grabbed one of those Japs down there one time because he come at me with his, he carried a riding quirk with him all the time. And when he come at me, because I wasn't work, let everybody else sit down and rest and he wanted me to keep working, but I wouldn't do it. So he come after him. And when he raised it up there, I grabbed him, both arms went him. And then they turned me in to the jet guards out up south side. <clears throat> they made me bend over and they used a pine pole on my back and I mean they beat me for 10 or 15 minutes there and I couldn't very well get around for three weeks but I didn't let them beat me down if they beat you down they kill you it was a condemned coal mine <laughs> it was condemned in 1936 by American engineers <laughs> they didn't care about it coming down on us or whatever happened yeah, used to sabotage the jackhammer. Of poor sand. You know, they, they, they got me one time and caught me doing it. They give me a good beating. That like one time they I beat me so bad I couldn't work. And one boy tried to get me to break his arm and I wouldn't do it. They'd get him out of work in a while, yeah. One of her own told the Japs what was happening. Japs thought it was accidents, but they, one of her own uh, soldiers told the Japs it, they, it was not accidents, they were doing it. So when it got so much, <clears throat> they told them, says, anybody comes in with a broken leg, we cut it off. If you broke your arm, you cut it off. And that stopped it, see. Our diet there was um, rice, boiled rice, and some greens 
they'd send out uh, uh, groups of people to the mountainside to, to pick certain kinds of greens that were up there. And we occasionally would get dried fish. When they put those fish out to dry, they'd be, um, flies could get to them and mm -hmm. we had, and some of it uh, was covered with maggots but you'd brush the maggots off and 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 eat because that was we get, didn't get it very often but that was the only protein we got and so finally they pulled into uh, moji japan and we were all in rags uh, and skin and bone and rags and uh, we got off the, when we got off the ship uh, there were hundreds of japanese civilians watching us and they were over the rags and, and they put us on trucks and they took us to Camp 17. And I, I never thought I'd ever come back. I thought I was going to die. You, you never got any rice like you see. It's all red and coarse. But I ate it and I loved it because <laughs> that's what was keeping me alive. As American forces drew ever closer to the home islands, Japanese authorities issued a new order dated August 1st, 1944. It read, The moment American troops set foot on the sacred soil of Japan, all POWs are to be put to death. If the Americans ever invade Japan, which it was already forming in Okinawa, getting ready for the invasion, mm -hmm. every American prisoner of war, every British prisoner of war, everyone will be put to death, either by firing squads, gas, or fire. If the Americans invade Japan, all prisoners will be executed. To the American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines preparing for the final bloody invasion of Japan, the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki shortened the war. To the POWs, those bombs were their salvation. Now a lot of people says today, why did we drop that bomb on Japan? Let me tell you something, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. If the Americans had invaded Japan, it wouldn't have been a prisoner alive. The morning they dropped that bomb, he lined us up, pulled out that saber. He walked up down that line in black boots, just a clicking, just walking up and down the line. I'm standing up in the front rank, I'm just standing there, just, just standing. He says, Kino, that was yesterday. American, he's Skokie, plane, American plane. B needs you Q, B-29. Cheese, I buck small bomb. Everything go. And I wonder what in the world it was. You know, I done been locked up, no communications, no letters, no nothing, everything, you know. But what it was, the atomic bomb had destroyed the whole city. We didn't know it. So I think it saved my life. The atomic bomb, but, 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 but it killed thousands and thousands of Japanese. I don't know if it's worth it, you know. But it did save my life. And then the guards disappeared. The Dutch Airborne liberated us. It was in September, September the 4th of 5th. And I had the opportunity, a bunch of us got out, and we went over that old mill. We was after everything. Guys was grabbing rifles and shooting guards. I, I didn't do that. I said, listen. I done been through too much. I done seen so much hatred in my life. I didn't want no more of it. I just just got sick of it. First thing it was, we cut out strips, put on top, P.O.W. on mm -hmm. top. After we knew the war was over, hey, woke up, the guards are gone. Hey, I grabbed a Japanese rifle when I met those down here. I'm going down the street with a Japanese rifle. It's a dang wonder somebody hadn't shot me. I didn't know what I was doing. I had that rifle. I figured it might save me, you know, if I got in a tight spot. The soldiers come in on the 13th of September. See, the war was over on the 15th of August. And uh, then we waited. This liberating party got in. And I got sick and couldn't leave the camp. They said, if you go down to the end of the island, you could catch a ride out on the planes that the engineers bringing stuff in and going out empty. Some of them did, but I, I got sick and couldn't go. And it was the 16th of September before I got out of that camp. When the, I was in the sick bay, 
and the two Japanese uh, came in uh, and announced that the war was over. Uh -huh. And um, they, uh, they didn't say how it ended, but it was obvious mm -hmm. how it ended, and one of them saluted me. Well, Must have been a... I thought this, this is really a change of attitude. Next morning, every Japanese was gone from the place. There was one sergeant there, they called him, they called him Dopey. And his chief occupation was going around hitting the uh, prisoners. Hit them on the side of the head and then uh, after, after the um, Japanese surrender, he, before he left, he'd come around the camp and beg some of the guys to hit him. Mm. He wanted an even exchange. <laughs> that he was afraid some of them were going to kill him, I think. Yeah. But two days later, the, the old colonel that I spoke of before, came, stood up on the high bank above us, and we were all lined up, and, and he gave us a lecture on the uh, terrible things we had done, our violation of the Geneva Convention. And I didn't, such an atrocity, I didn't know then he was talking about the atomic bomb. I heard plane motors. So I looked up in the sky and I said, to see the sun glinting off the wings of an airplane. There was American airplanes going over. And uh, then I heard, I looked and I saw a big plume of smoke over Nagasaki. Now, I didn't know at the time what it was, but that was the atomic bomb. And uh, about four days after that, I was, down, I was in a coal mine. I was building my Yumuk and the, and the civilians said, the boot died just on, everybody out, everybody out, everybody out. So we went out, and there I was, I got my, my G-string and my hat and my rubber toe shoes, and I'm free. The war is over. We got down to the, where the Americans were, and uh, they fed us off bread. I hadn't had bread three and a half years. I couldn't get enough bread. For many POWs, the ability to survive in a day-to-day, -day nightmarish situation had nothing to do with religion, patriotism or family to get through one more day was each man's goal you serve one year in that and you become hard you have no emotions no feelings no nothing the only thing you've got in the back of your mind is one little key word is survival 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 eat anything it make no difference stay alive hardships bring you together it gives you a better outlook on life. It makes you understand things better. Spiritual and physical, maybe not, not maybe not physical, but mentally and spiritually, it makes a better person out of you. To really understand things sometimes, it shouldn't happen this way. You have to be not plumbed down to the bottom before you can look up, before you can look up. Mm -hmm. Where you appreciate the A cup of water a day, one rice bowl. A cup of water a day, one rice bowl. 30 days in there and you know and I kept I was getting hard I listen I was hard as concrete I didn't weigh about 80 90 pounds but there's nothing phasing me you're living in a different world altogether you're not living in reality you're living in a zone that it it's where you it's hard to explain you're living in something that you're more of a robot and you go by commands because you have no emotions there's no emotions. You don't have any. You just don't have no emotion. A man fall dead right there. It didn't bother you. When they executed somebody, you just stood there and looked. I tried not to let it bother me. Because, uh, I mean, I didn't dwell on any of that stuff. I just, I'd make up a mind on something else. And, uh, that helped me get a, through there. Have the ter determination to survive. That's all you're trying to do is survive. Uh, at times, I, I, I just, it was three and a half years. I, I got to the point where I thought I was hopeless. 
I, I figured I was a dead man, you know. Many, many times I figured I was a dead man. But you had to make decisions. And sometimes you made a wise decision, but mostly you made bad decisions. You just, you just can't help it. I'm not a hero, you know. I got caught over there and all I did was try to survive. I, I was not, never a hero. I, I don't want you to think I was a hero. I was just trying to survive. Boy, I built a shield. I had a shield that protected me. It still protects me. I didn't even think of it. I just wanted to, I just wanted to live. I just wanted to live. In the European theater of war, American POWs numbered 94,000, and one in 25 of these Americans died in German POW camps. In the Pacific War, American POWs numbered 27,000, and one in three of these Americans died in Japanese camps. This sideshow of the Pacific War has been lost to history, but not lost in the memories of those who just wanted to survive. They gave a POW medal in 1980 some. In fact, I, I got home, I got, I got no disability, I got nothing. So they, they gave me a 10% disability and they took it away from me. They disregarded me completely. I, I'm telling you, I, even when, on my army discharge, they put nothing on me. I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was treated cruelly, honest to God. They didn't care about me. They didn't, the Army didn't care about me. They still don't. I was a dead man for three and a half years. I got nothing. I wonder why nobody seems to care. That's the whole thing. I can't get it across the way I should. You know, I, I can't explain the suffering I went through, the torture I went through in Command of One. You know, it's it just, how can I explain it? If we do not want to die together in war, we must learn to live together in peace.